Paul, we know from the notes in the program that uh, you were saved in 1972. Not many people were saved through taking an exam, but you were. Tell us how. Well, I, uh, I was in the middle of the exam at the Bucharest University for clinical psychology. And in Romania at that time, entry examination was the most challenging and difficult exam in life. To qualify for clinical psychology at that time, one had to prove that one was not a Christian. And I was not. So I started the exam proving that I was not a Christian. Halfway through, God arrested me. And I became a Christian. And I was accepted. I was accepted to study clinical psychology. And the first class I took in the fall of 1972 was the class on atheism. And I stood up for Christ. And that was the beginning of persecution for the remaining of the years under communism. We, we first met in 1990 in Switzerland, just yeah. uh, a matter of a few months after the Ceausescu regime had come to an end. In those days living under communism, you're preaching on hope this evening. Were there ever times when you thought life will be different? Yes, we had our mountains top experience and we had our valleys. I do remember of a time when being out for preaching evangelistic meetings, I came home just to find that my family has been attacked by the communist police and our children were under attack. At that time I felt that God was not caring for my children as I cared for his children. I felt that God let me down and the thought came to my mind that I should take my family and escape from Romania. I went to see a close friend of mine and told him that I was so discouraged and down and that I was reflecting of leaving Romania. That friend asked me to spend a few hours at his place. He left and came back about an hour and so ago uh, afterwards and he brought an old piece of paper. It was the letter of a man who spent all his years in prison for Christ and he wrote a final letter to his family before he was killed by the communist. And the letter, the, the letter ended with this picture. Lord, I know that I come home. And I look forward to seeing you, to see the glory of heaven, to see all the great men of God and all the great women of God, to see the great evangelists and the great singers and the great missionaries. But Lord, on that day, when the parade in heaven will take place, allow me to come in the uniform of a Romanian prisoner because I want to praise you all eternity for Christ. That letter healed my heart. Mm -hmm. And we prayed with my wife and we decided that we will stay and be God's children for his glory in Romania. Now there are folk here who um, do. No. <laughs> I can't imagine that in the difficult days of communism in Eastern Europe, we wouldn't have had a Keswick without Eastern Europe being mentioned in our prayers. We now have days of freedom. What's the greatest challenge to Christians in Romania in the 21st century? Now there is freedom. I do believe that in many ways, freedom is more challenging to Christian faith than persecution. In times of persecution, the world is not friendly. Things are so clear, black and white. You are either with Christ or against him. And there's just one major decision to make, to be ready to give your life for Christ. But in times of freedom, there are no such dramatic decisions. There are small decisions, however, and we compromise in what we call small decisions. So the greatest challenge is that we will be as faithful in time of freedom as we were in time of persecution. And please do pray for us that we will not compromise in times of freedom. And Paul's our preacher this evening. We're going to pray for him now. Lord, we thank you for your saving power mm, in the life of our brother Paul, that in days of university you mm. called him to be a Christian. We bless you for that. And we thank you for your keeping power in difficult days, in days of persecution, 
in days when but for your hand of protection upon his life, he might have abandoned his faith. So we thank you for your keeping power. And we thank you for your maturing power in his life. Thank you that in these days of freedom, both as a pastor, as a leader of a university, in the many ways in which he represents Romania in other parts of the world, thank you that you are maturing him, making him a wise man, giving him the mind of Christ. And we need that mind this evening. Pray that you will endue him with power from on high. As he opens your word, give us open hearts, we pray. As he opens his mouth, may the power of the Spirit anoint him with unction from on high, that he truly will be your messenger before us this evening. We receive him as he comes among us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now tonight Paul is going to be uh, speaking on John chapter 3, but we're going to read Ezekiel 37 because he's also going to refer to that passage. So if you would like to turn to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel chapter 37 and we'll read the first 14 verses. The Valley of Dry Bones. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me around among the old dry bones that covered um, the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to breathe into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke these words just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as they had been before. Then as I watched, muscle and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies. But they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak to the winds and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke as he commanded me. And the wind entered the bodies. And they began to breathe. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army of them. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old dry bones. All hope is gone. Now give them this message from the sovereign Lord, O oh, my people. I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You will see that I have done everything just as I promised, I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen. And may God speak to us through his word this evening. As we've said, Paul's going to be speaking on the theme of hope. And this passage in Ezekiel is acknowledging that hope has been lost, as represented by the dry bones, because people have stopped listening to and trusting God. And so they have ended up in a hopeless situation. 
And I want us to take just a few minutes, short minutes this evening, before Paul comes to speak to us, to, in the quietness, think of the situations that we face or that we know of that leave us tempted to hopelessness. It may be a personal situation. It may be a situation in your church or in your community, at work, in our nation or in another nation in the world. But just take a few moments to think and ponder what tempts you to hopelessness. What tempts you to despair? We'll have just a minute or two of silence and then John will come and lead us in a song. Please do be seated. A pastor wanted to buy a pet for his family. And after some reflection, he decided to buy a speaking parrot. He bought the parrot, took it home, and put the parrot into a cage, and was eager to hear the first words that the parrot will speak. As the first visitor came, the parrot said from his cage, let's kiss. <laughs> well, that was all that the parrot kept saying. When people come, the parrot will say, let's kiss. Now, that was not very nice for a pastor because all kinds of people came to his home. <laughs> so he worked hard to change the vocabulary of his parrot and with no success at all. One day, as he was losing hope, he heard that one of the deacons of his church has a parrot too. And the deacon's parrot was more religious in his language. <laughs> Whenever somebody came to the deacon's place, his parrot would say, let's pray. <laughs> oh, that was nice. So the pastor approached the deacon and said, would you mind helping me. I have this problem with my parrot, and I heard that you have a, a, a speaking parrot as well, with these nice words, let's pray. Would you allow me to bring my parrot and put it in the same cage with your parrot, and maybe he will change his words? Well, you know, deacons love pastors. So the deacon said, by all means, pastor. And the pastor took his parrot, to the deacon's place, put it in the same cage, and the two parrots look at each other, and finally the pastor's parrot broke the silence and said, let's kiss. <laughs> and the deacon's parrot responded, thank God for hearing my prayer. <laughs> well, there is a lesson to this story changing the place will not change your life. Changing the place will not change my life. There is something more about changing lives. And tonight I will invite you to open the Bibles at the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John chapter 3 this is a great passage when two rabbis speak together one late evening. There was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler, of, a ruler of the Jew. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Two rabbis talking one late evening. One was an older, well-known rabbi, Nicodemus. The other was a younger rabbi, and not as well-known by the educated people of the day. However, wherever the younger rabbi went, the crowds kept growing. Great multitudes came to listen to him. He taught as no one else was teaching at the time. Things were happening there where this young rabbi was working. The old rabbi just kept his traditional rabbinical teaching and not much was happening around. So one night he came to this young rabbi and asked him something about techniques. Why is that? The crowd is growing. How come that you perform so many miracles? Surely you must come from God. Tell me about these techniques. So the young rabbi answered him that all that I'm doing is not about techniques, but about truth. There was the debate, techniques or truth. And I can identify the same problems in our own generation. So many people are interested about techniques. How can we do this? How can we grow churches? How can we disciple people? How can we do this or do that? And all is about techniques. Missionary work is about techniques. So the old rabbi come and he wanted to get some of the more updated techniques. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, my ministry, the essence of what I am doing is not about techniques. It is about truth. You can learn all the techniques of the day and miss the kingdom of heaven. You can master the art of communication. You can master mass communication. Large crowds. But miss the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see and enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The essence of the matter is be born from above, not techniques. But truth. Well, Nicodemus heard this message about new birth, and in a very rabbinical way, he answered, 
Well, let me, let me tell you what the question might be here. Can an old man enter into his mother's womb and be born again? So tell me what you are saying. Does it make sense? Because to me it seems it's absurd. What you are talking about is not truth, but is nonsense. How can an old man be born again? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, what I am telling you is about regeneration, not self-realization. Regeneration, not self-realization. Nicodemus was interested to know how can a man's life be improved? How can a man be changed? Thus far, it seems that both of them agree that something is wrong with human life, with human being. Something is wrong with us. So how can we improve human life? And Jesus said, the essence of the changing lives is regeneration. Unless a man is being born from above, born of the Spirit, one is not qualified for the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said, how can that happen? Is there a hope for an old man? Is there something that a, an old man can do and change his life? Now we know that old dogs do not learn new tricks. The older we get, the harder to change. So we'll say, an old man is hopeless. So this was the point that Nicodemus tried to drive home. If an old man hears your teaching, does it make sense? Is there something that can change the life of an old man? And another problem that is, aspect that is, is being implied there. Who has the authority to tell a man to change his life? Can somebody come and tell you, well, your life is not okay, you must change your life? Is there hope for an old man? Now Jesus gave Nicodemus an astonishing answer. He didn't directly answer the question that there is hope for an old man, but gave an answer. He said, well, the transformation, the regeneration of a life is something that you understand if you look back into the Old Testament of a great story that the Spirit has been at work. And that sent Nicodemus to the text that we had from Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Here is a great story in the Old Testament. Captivity. Hopeless situation. A whole generation being taken out from their land. And God wanted to teach Ezekiel a great lesson. One day God took Ezekiel for a very unusual trip. Not to Cumbria, not to the Lake District, but to a valley packed with dry bones. And God said, Ezekiel, just walk around this valley and look at these bones. And Ezekiel looked at the bones and there were many and they were dry. So God asked ask him a question. He said, Ezekiel, tell me, can these dry bones come alive? I work with students day after day. And when I ask students a question, I want them to give me an answer. And this is the kind of question that re, uh, requires an answer, yes or no. So God asked Ezekiel, can these bones come alive? And he should have answered, yes, Lord, or no, Lord. Well, Ezekiel was a, a very unusual student. He said, okay, Lord, this is a great question, but I think you have the answer. <laughs> and God said, okay, Ezekiel, if I have the answer, you have the assignment. I will ask you to preach a sermon here. Stand up, Ezekiel, and preach a sermon and address these bones and do not say, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> Beloved visitors, but just tell them, dry bones, 
hear the word of the Lord. God said, Ezekiel, I want you to preach a sermon here and preach the word of God to the dry bones. And Ezekiel did. He preached a sermon. And as he preached, something happened. The bones started to move. They came together. They formed skeletons. And flesh grew. And skin covered it. As he preached, something was happening there. And after he preached the first sermon, the Lord said, now Ezekiel, I want you to preach the second sermon. Speak to the wind. And say, O oh, wind, come. And breathe over these bones. Speak and invite the Ruach to come. That breath of God that gave life at the very beginning. Call upon the Spirit and ask Him to come. And the Spirit came. And there was life. So Jesus said, Nicodemus, do you know the story from the book of Ezekiel? You ask, is there hope for an old man? And my answer is, there is hope for a dead man. You see the difference? The answer from God is there is hope for a dead man because we are not aging in our sins and trespasses. We are dead in sins and trespasses. We are dead, separated from the source of life. Is there hope for an old man? And God said there is hope for a dead man. In many respects. Europe looks like the valley of dry bones in many respects the situation is similar and we ask ourselves is there hope and Jesus said yes there is hope there is hope when the word of God is being preached and the Spirit of God is at work Nicodemus said can an old man do something for himself is there Room for self-realization? And Jesus said, no. There is room for regeneration. Now we live in a time when people want to do something for themselves. There are so many experts around the world who are telling us what we must do to improve our lives. Among other things, I do teach psychology at a state university in Romania. In addition to teaching doctrines at the Emmanuel University, I teach psychology and the class I teach is theories of personality. For a whole year, I have the psychology students and I have to teach them all the major theories of personality. So I organize my class, my course like this. The first day when I meet the students, I tell them what we'll cover in that class. So we will cover all the major psychologies that belong to the psychodynamic theory, and we look at all the major psychologies that belong to the behavioral and cognitive theories, and all the major psychologies that belong to the traits theories, and all the major psychologies that belong to the humanistic theory. So I start with Freud and his disciples, and we move to B.F. Skinner and Bandura and their disciples, and we move to Gordon Allport and Cattell and their disciples, and we move to Abraham Maslow, and we move to Carl Rogers and their disciples. And then I tell my students, the last class, the last course, we look at Jesus and his views on human personality. This is a state university. So after I teach all these classes, all these courses, all these great, famous psychologists and their theories, I tell my students this. Now, I want you to pause for a moment and ask you to bow your heads. I said, just imagine that now you have a personal problem. And you're about to go to a psychologist. Well, let me help you and I will take you to all of them one by one. Let's imagine that we knock at the door of Sigmund Freud. Well, this is what we, he will tell you. Just lie there on the coach 
and tell me whatever comes to your mind. Don't try to sort it out. Don't try to, to uh, clarify this or to, uh, to somehow uh, get rid of some thoughts. Just tell me as it comes into your mind, just freely. Make those free associations. And you come today, and you come next week, and you come five years from now, and you come 20 years from now, and you keep telling him there on the couch. Or if you go to B.F. Skinner and his disciples, he will teach you some techniques. And he will keep teaching you, and as you learn one technique, you have hope that this will change. You go home, and you discover that it doesn't change. So he will teach you a new technique. Or you go to Gordon Allport and say, well, every human being has certain cardinal traits. You are like this, and some, uh, some people are like that, and each human being is different in his, her own way. So you have to live with, with yourself. This is how you are. Or you go to Abraham Maslow or Carl Rogers and say, well, all that you need is to be left alone and affirmed by everybody. So all you need is unconditional affirmation. You must be self-assertive. You must take the courage and just do as you feel things ought to be done. And everybody else must affirm you. That means if your child comes home and burn your house down to the ashes, you look at your child and unconditionally affirm him, said, I am so proud of you. <laughs> Nobody in our family made a fire as big as this one. Because that's all about. Let him be as he is. Do not interfere. And then I said, now, after you've been to all of this, we knock at the door of Jesus Christ. Is that right? No. He is knocking at our door. Jesus is not waiting upon us to go to his office and pay the ticket to get in. He comes to our office and Jesus tells us that sin has separated us from life. The source of life. Sin has distorted our lives. Sin is causing all the problems in the relationship that we have. And is bringing all this misery in our life. Because we've not been created to live like that. We've been, we've been created to live in perfect relationship with God. He comes to tell us what is wrong with us. And Jesus comes to bring us back to life. And there is hope for a dead man. Not just for an old man. There is hope for the valleys of the dry bones. Well, Nicodemus heard all of this. And he had one more question. He said, Lord, explain me how does this work? If the word of God, if the spirit of God has the power to change a life, to regenerate to bring about new birth. How does this work? Oh, Jesus said, I'm glad you ask. Let's go back into the Old Testament. Let's go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. And you know the story from the book of, books of, Num, book of Numbers. The children of Israel were on their journey in the wilderness to the Red Sea. And one point in that journey, they were so upset with God. They spoke against God. They began to criticize God. They said, well, the way God organized our life is so absurd. Why are we here in the wilderness and eat this food, manna? We don't like it. I, we don't like the way God is organizing the universe, how he leads history, how he leads everything. We probably do a better job like God, than God. Well, God said, okay, if you can do a better job, I will let you for a few days just cope with some serpents. So God said, I will not keep my hands upon serpents and let them come into the camp. And the serpents came, all the, the vipers came there, and they started to bite people, and they were dying, poisoned. So the people complained, and they, they went to Moses and said, Moses, do something, pray for us. And Moses went to God and said, God, what is the answer? Because people are dying. And God said, Moses, I want you to lift up a bronze serpent on a pole. And whosoever is being bitten by a serpent, just look at that pole, and they will be saved. So Moses did like this, and he lifted up the serpent on the pole, 
And those who were dying had to do something. Now let me tell you something that works perfectly in Romania. If Moses were a Romanian, and all the people there were Romanians, I tell you how would they approach the whole issue. They would have gone to Moses and said, Moses, I know that this is the solution. I know that this is the answer, but let's, let's work things a little around here. You see, Moses, I sin against God, but my home is right at the fringe of the camp, at the edge. Now I cannot see the pole from there. And I have to come all the way to the central square there and look at the pole and be healed. Now everybody will look at me and say, oh, look at so-and-so, he's a sinner. He spoke against God. He did something terrible. Well, look upon him while well, it's very embarrassing Moses. Let's do something like this. Can't I have a small snake? Just a tiny one here. I will have it here in my pocket. Or at home. Because, you know, Moses, nobody is perfect. I do something wrong once in a while. But why should I come all the way up front and everybody see me? Moses, let me have that small snake and when things are getting bad, I just look at it, and nobody knows. That would the Romanian do. <laughs> and Jesus was speaking to a rabbi and said, Nicodemus, do you remember the whole story? When people were dying, they had to come out and look at that serpent and be healed, be saved. Now, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the sermon, so shall be the Son of God lifted up upon a cross. And those who are dying in sin must look upon the cross of Christ and publicly and personally repent of their sins and believe in Christ. So Nicodemus, it is faith, not festivals. It is faith, not festivals. It is truth, not techniques. It is regeneration, not self-assertion. It is faith, not festivals. Look upon the cross of Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, and believe in Jesus, and life will be changed. Now you may ask yourself, is that as simple as that? Yes. It is as simple as that. I have been working for about eight years as a clinical psychologist in a psychiatric hospital in Romania. And I am working as a pastor for 20 years by now. As a clinical psychologist, I could invite my clients time and again and try to put a new patch to an old rag. As a pastor, I point toward Jesus. When I took over the pastorate of the church, the church had about 1,000 members. Today it has 4,000 members. Meanwhile, we planted more than 10 new churches in the area. And it works. But let me personalize this. I teach our students to not lose the focus with techniques but focus on Christ. And I encourage them to go and present Christ to all those who are lost. Last February, one of our theology students went as usual to the campus of the state university in town to present Christ to those who are not saved. About 10 o'clock at night when he finished witnessing, was about to come back to our campus, seven or eight non-Christian students surrounded him and said, well, he is one of these repenters. And they started to verbally abuse him, and then they went on and started to physically abuse him. One of those students is an expert in martial arts. And that expert in martial arts 
hit our students on the forehead, broke his face, and damaged his brain. The students collapsed, and he was bleeding, and all the others start kicking and jumping with their feet on him. Later, minutes later, the students regained his conscience and he tried to escape, to run. And the aggressors ran after him and beat him to the point of death. Then they said, okay, let's take him now to the river and just throw him in the water in February, minus 20, freezing water. Say, let's throw him in the river and drown him. They drag him to the river bank and they grab him by hands and feet, and they were about to throw him in the river. At that point, the students regained again his conscience. He realized what is happening, and he prayed out loud. He said, Lord, I know that I'm coming home. And I'm so glad that I'm saved. I'm your children. I'm your child. But I'm so ashamed because I've done so little for you. When he said those words, the aggressors just lost their power. They dropped him there on the bank and ran away. The students crawl into the street and try to stop a car, and no car will stop. Then he had to crawl half a mile to a, a nearby taxi cab station. A taxi cab driver took him to hospital, and that was midnight when he was taken to hospital, put immediately on the life support machine. And the doctor discovered that the, the damage he had in his brain may cause him epilepsy for the rest of his life. Then the hospital authorities sent for his wife. His wife came, spent the rest of the night on her husband's bedside, prayed for him. He regained his conscience again by 5 o'clock, and he prayed with his wife until 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock in the morning, his wife said, you know what? I go and speak to those who beat you up. She went to the campus, identified all seven of them, called them downstairs in the meeting place. They all came. She looked at them and said, I'm not here to call upon police. I'm not here to take revenge. I'm here with a different message. But before I tell you what I have, I want to know who is the one who hit my husband and damaged his brain. And this martial arts expert stepped forward, very proud, very aggressive, said, I did. And the wife of our student looked at him and said, I want you to know that my husband and myself, we love you and we forgive you. And I'm here to tell you that we, we love and forgive you because Jesus loves us. And he forgave us. And he, we are here to tell you about the love of Jesus. That student accepted Christ right there on the spot. Then he walked with this lady to the hospital. Ask forgiveness to our student. Spend hours with him in hospital. And as a new convert, he prayed for his victim. Weeks later, as Lilian, that's the name of the student, came out of hospital... He and his wife, Rima, and we, uh, with the aggressor, John, came all to our chapel. Every Wednesday lunchtime, we have a chapel with the whole school. And they came and they gave their testimony. And John, the aggressor, stepped forward and said, That moment when this lady told me that she loves me because Jesus loves her, for the first time in my life, I saw Jesus as the Son of God. And that's my Savior. And I was saved there. Now, Lilian and Rima, his wife, are discipling John. And John is doing evangelism among those who are his colleagues in sports, in martial arts. And Lilian and Rima are doing evangelism uh, uh, among the others. Now, you see, there is the serpent that has been lifted up in the days of Moses, but it is Christ that has been lifted up in our days. And Jesus said, Nicodemus. If you want to be saved, born again, look upon Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, in addition to some of these disciples that were far away, and some of the women, do you know who came to look upon Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea, 
and Nicodemus. Nicodemus understood that there is hope. As we conclude tonight, let me remind you, it is not enough to change the cage or the place. What is needed? What is the essential? We must change our master. We must change the human perspective with God's perspective. Christ still saves. Let me tell you, as I conclude, in the communist days, he saved communists. In the days of freedom, he saves free people, politically free, but spiritually in bondage. He saves. Is there hope for an old man? There is hope for a dead man. Is there hope for Great Britain? Oh yes, there is hope for France. There is hope for Germany. There is hope for Romania. There is hope for Russia. There is hope for China. There is hope for the Muslim world. Is there hope? Yes, because we have a living Lord. Amen.